most electronic products are written made in Dr. Made in China. And the significance for that is the, the manufacturer wants to show you that China is the country of origin of this product. Not just for fun, for this purpose. If this product is giving you problems, don't take it to Israel. You know where to take it if this thing is not working. Because I told you where it comes from. And I submitted last night, if worship was a product, worship would be written, made in heaven. Meaning, when we get stuck and don't understand how worship is supposed to function, we don't ask religion. We don't ask our denominations. We must ask heaven. I read a story, I believe, pardon me, because I've been preaching in other seven places, so I'm not sure the things I, t I said here or there. I read a story in the book by Pastor Rick Warren. He talks, he, he's talking in the story about he was driving to a certain campsite in the mountain areas. And they told him, it's going to take you an hour from the entry point to get there. And two and a half hours later, he realizes that I must be lost. Because they said it's an hour, I've been driving to two and a half hours. When he stopped for directions, they said to him, Sir, you can't get there, the game side, from where you are. Because there are no more tents ahead that will get you there. The only way for you to get there, you must go back to the beginning. Because the only turn that will get you there is two kilometers from the entry point. Sure. Truth is, as the church, we can't get to God's original purpose for worship from where we are. We have gone for too long in the wrong direction. There are no other turns ahead but a dead end. For how long have we been singing slow songs? And yet lives are not changing. I mentioned just night now that if the slow songs had the power to change our lives and make us like God, we who sit in church should have changed long ago. Mm. Instead, it's like we are the one who needs more prayer. Because we portray an image Sunday on stage that contradicts who we are on Monday. Mm, mm, mm. Sunday morning with the same mouth, you are holy. Monday morning, we cursing people. S and F words. Can sweet and bitter water flow from the same stream? So this whole slow song phenomenon is not working. When God designed worship, he was not designing something for our enjoyment. He designed worship so that worship can impact our lives. And we're going to talk about the purpose for worship today. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, tell me if you go to the book of Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Let's just establish a good foundation for our talk. Proverbs 19, verse number 21. We're talking about purpose. What is purpose? Purpose is the original intent for existence. Purpose is the reason why something exists. Amen. Proverbs 19 verse 21. The Bible says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. I read it again. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Change the translation. God doesn't care much about our plans, but his own purpose. God doesn't care what you have planned. He cares about the purpose why he brought you here. And the sooner we realize that is the lesser we frustrate ourselves unnecessarily. Because 
because the purpose of a thing is known by the creator of a thing. Mm. Can you imagine this phone created by Sony after they created it and the phone wants to tell the Sony company what it wants to do? It doesn't work like that. It's them that tells the folk why they make you. It's the same with us. It's the same with worship. The one who made worship is the one who is best positioned to tell us why he made worship. Amen. So it's important for us to understand the truth. That no matter what plans we have for worship, if those plans don't align with God's purpose, that thing will not produce. As a matter of fact, I have learned that the reason for abuse is ignorance of purpose. In our country, the reason why there's so many men that are abusing women is because those men don't know the purpose for a woman. If you knew the purpose for a woman, we wouldn't treat women the way we treat them. But when the purpose is not known, abuse is an obvious case. The Bible says the woman, when God made woman, he was making the helper for the man. If you know that this person is here to help me, why abuse him? Why abuse the very same person who makes you look smart? Because if you move her out of the picture, you are in trouble. But because we don't know the pebbles, we mistreat, we abuse, we misuse, we overuse, we underuse. Because we don't know the pebbles. We only reduce worship to an emotional outburst. We come Sunday morning, we cry, and go back to the sins we were crying upon the church. <laughs> when the purpose is not known, abuse, simplicity. Now let me draw a second point. It's important then for us to understand why God instructed us to worship Him. Amen. Why God commanded worship? Because God commanded us to worship Him and no other God but Him. So we need to go to the manual and find what is the reason why God commanded us to worship. But before I take you there, let me establish a principle which becomes our premise. Because it's important for, for me to get you to be in a certain line of thought so that when we get there, you'll appreciate where we are. Come with me to John chapter 4. Remember, we've established the truth that the purpose of God is what is going to be true. Meaning God has a purpose for everything. And since we're talking about worship, God has a purpose for worship. Until God's purpose for worship becomes our pursuit, worship won't produce in our lives what God had in mind. The word purpose simply means the original intent. John chapter 4. It's the story we know. Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. But I want to pick up from verse number 7 so we can draw the principle that becomes our premises. Amen. Verse number 7 says, When a Samaritan woman... Oh, church, you have to go back for context. Let's pick it up from verse number 4. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Seca, near the broad of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Verse number 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Let me submit this. I know we just sang this song now. Through mm. from Samaria. Mm. I submit to you, according to what is written in the Bible, Jesus, when he asked for the water, Jesus was not thirsty. Mm. Look at the Bible. It says, verse number 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being tired, not 
first. Let's deal with that first. You see, it's us who assume Jesus was thirsty because he asked for water. But the Bible did not say he was thirsty. The Bible said he was tired. Churchy, what boldness you have to say that. In the Bible, when Jesus was thirsty, the Bible told us. When he was on the cross, he said, I am. <laughs> now, in this verse, there's no way the Bible says Jesus was thirsty. The Bible says he was tired. What's the first? This is the first that I'm making. Our assumption that Jesus was thirsty, that's why he asked for water, is robbing us of seeing the principle. It's us who assume he was thirsty because he asked for words. The Bible says the man was tired. And when he found a place next to the well, he said, If you are tired, the one thing you need is to sit down. When he found a place to sit, his need was met. Watch this. Verse number seven. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Why would you ask for a drink while you were tired or thirst? Hold that thought. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Verse nine. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask? Me for a drink, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus' response. This is proof that the man was not tested. Look at verse number 10. Jesus answered him, If you knew the gift of God, one, number two, and who is asking of you for a drink, you would have asked me, and I would have given you a living water. That's the proof right there. <laughs> I asked you. For something I don't need. Mm. Give me a drink. She said, Jesus, you are a Jew of Samaritan. Jesus showed his true colors. <laughs> Sometimes you must let people talk. The more they talk, the more who they are will show up. <laughs> don't be a hard to tell people to shut up because you are missing. When people talk, the true colors will show up. Mm. Jesus said, if you knew, number one, watch this, the gift of God. Number two, and who is asking of you? You would have asked me. Meaning, you are standing before someone who has better water, but you don't even know it. Mm. Principle. Jesus' request for water was not driven by his thirst, but it was driven by her thirst. He saw how thirsty she was. And he asked her for the very thing that she needs. I'm building the principle, bear with me. Jesus saw how thirsty she was because he was not thirsty. And he said, give me a drink. And when she raises racial issues, Jesus said, if you knew, you would ask me and I'll give you living water. This is the principle. Watch this. Whenever God asks us for anything, saints, it's not because he needs it. <laughs> when after God asks you for anything, it's not because He needs it. Say it again. Anytime God commands you to do something for Him, it's not because He needs the thing He's asking from you, but it's because He sees how much you need it. And He commands you to do it for Him. But if only you knew the gift of God 
and who is asking you to do the thing, you would ask him, can I do it for you? Now watch this. God has commanded us to worship him. Not because he needs the worship. But because he sees how much we need worship. And now you look at me you're like, now what are you saying? I'm saying exactly that. God does not need our worship. He wouldn't be God if he had needs. According to John 4.23, God is not even looking for worship. But he's looking for worshipers. Two different things. God does not need our worship. He is God whether we worship him or not. He is God. When you lift up your hands and say you are holy, it's not you who's making him holy. He's holy whether you say it or not. He's God whether you tell him or not. Listen, it's you who is discovering that he's holy. He knew he was holy before there was anyone to tell him he's holy. It's you who's discovering he's holy. It's you who's surprised. You are able to save me. He knew he was able to he is God all by himself. God is not some old man sitting in heaven, suffering in fear in the complex, waiting for people to tell him, you are beautiful. <laughs> we love you. Don't listen to the devil, you are good. God is content in his own skin if he had any. He does not need anything from us to make him feel better with himself. He is God whether you say something or not. But if you don't say anything, it's you who loses, not God. If when we worship him, we lift up our hands, you don't. You don't affect God. You are affecting your own life. Because when God designed worship, he didn't design it so that he can be better. He designed worship so that worship can make us better. Amen. 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 Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, interesting word, gift of God. And when you look now, let's go back to the beginning of Genesis. When God made man, the first thing God gave man it was not the woman but the very first thing God gave man was himself mm. the Bible says after God made man and he breathed into him the Bible says God took man and placed him in the garden the first gift God gave man when man became a living soul was an environment. It's the first thing. God placed man in a certain place. And that place was the symbol of his presence. The first thing God gave us is his presence. And everything else came out of the presence. Man found work in the presence of God. Man found a partner in the presence of God. The fruitfulness of man was because of what he was in the presence of God. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you. Now, Churchill was the big thing with the presence. I'm glad you asked. Listen. Back now, we are in Genesis 2. Back to Genesis 1. The Bible says, when God formed the heaven and earth, this is the, this is the pattern he used. For everything God wanted, God spoke to an environment to produce that thing. When God wanted the fish, God spoke to the sea. 
When God wanted the plants and the animals, God spoke to the ground. When God wanted the stars, God spoke to the sky. But when God wanted man, God spoke to himself. What's the significance? For everything God wanted, God spoke to the environment from which the thing must come out of. The environment in which the thing must live in. The environment in which the thing must be fed by. The environment wherein the thing must exist in. Anywhere else the thing dies. So when God wanted the fish and the sea creatures, he spoke to the waters. Why? Because it's in the water where the fish must live. It's in the water where the fish must be fed. It's in the water where the fish must survive. It's in the water where the fish is taken out it dies. Stars, same thing, sky. Plants and animals, same thing, the ground. But what he wanted you and I, he spoke to himself. Why? Because it's in him where we live, where we move, and we have our being. Anywhere else, we begin to die. Mm, mm. Like when you take the fish out of the water, you don't have to kill it. It dies automatically. When you are out of the presence of God, you don't have to be killed. You die automatically. You die. Yeah. When they sin, the Bible says God punished them out of the garden. Look at the very first thing that happened. When God placed man in the garden, he didn't say, work so you can live. No. Man was eating whatever he wants. Things he didn't work for. Because in the presence of the Lord, there is no struggle for life. But when God chased them out, he said, from today, you will eat because outside of the presence of the Lord, you work hard. We were not made to live outside of the presence of God. Your place of existence is the presence of the Lord. Anywhere else, you begin to rot while you are alive. Look at our brothers and sisters in the world. They are rotting while they are alive. They say we have life. There is no life. They say they are enjoying. There is no enjoyment. It's because they are in a place they were not made to exist. Away from the presence of the Lord. Watch this. One of the differences between praise and worship. I'll come back to this thought. Let me establish another thought. One of the differences between praise and worship that I shared yesterday morning with the worship leaders is that when we praise God, God is on the stage. We are the audience and are clapping for Him. Oh, you've been so good to me. You keep on providing for my family. I thank you for the shirt. The enemy tried to attack me, but you lifted up a standard against him. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's you claiming for God. But when we worship, we swap positions. God is the audience. We are on the stage. Mm. And the question is, is he claiming? Uh, <laughs> when he's on the stage, you are the audience. You are so forever. Uh, wow. God is good. Look what the Lord has done. But when we worship, we swap position. He's the audience, and you are on the stage. And the question is, is he clapping? I leave that for you to be a Make sure that you give God the best show. When God looks at you, can he say, Echo? <laughs> is it that good? Or he feels like picking up tomatoes and eggs. <laughs> the second difference between praise and worship now, this is the one that I want to draw attention to. Praise attracts the presence of God to where the praiser is. The Bible says, Chief Jehoshaphat and 
the nation of Judah were going to the battle, not church. And when they praised God, God showed up where they were. Paul and Silas, Acts 16 25, they were in prison, not in church. They praised God in prison, God showed up where they were. Joshua chapter 6, they were facing the wall of Jericho. And they praised the Lord where they were. And God showed up where they were. Praise attracts the presence of God to where the praise of is. Psalm 22, verse 3, David says, Oh Lord, you are holy. You inherit the praises of your people. But worship, watch this. Praise draws the presence of God to where the praise of is. But worship does not draw the presence of God to where the worshiper is. No. And you must not get your attention. Because we are used to say, oh God, we worship you can't, Father. That's not biblically correct. Worship does not draw the presence of God. It's that worship draws the worshiper to where God is. When you read the Bible very well, and when the Bible speaks about worship, it would say, so and so brought. Wrong English. You can't brought it if you didn't move. Meaning, the worshiper must leave the place where he was and go to where God is. That's why when God called Abraham, the key test were read Friday night. He said, go and take your son, your only son whom you love, I said, go and sacrifice him in the region of Moria. On one of the mountains, I will show you who did the moving. It's Abraham who left his home. It's not God who left his mountain and came to Abraham. In worship, God is not moving. In worship, the worshiper is moving. Because in worship, God is the standard. The worshiper must attempt to become like him. Amen. Amen. So in worship, God does not come to your level. It's you who must rise to his level. That's why in worship, God, he has terms and conditions. When Moses saw the burning bush and he was walking towards God, God said, you are coming too close, but you don't look like the place you are coming to. Take off your sentence. Because when you come to me, there are terms and conditions. You can't come to me the way you are. I can come to you the way you are. But if you come to me, there are terms and conditions. You must take off some stuff. And I wonder what kind of worship that we've been doing that we walk in and out of his presence the way we are and nothing changes. It's because the slow songs are not going to change your life. But true worship is going to change. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Oh, yeah. The closer you draw to fire, some stuff must be burning. Yeah. If nothing burns, you're not, you're not moving close to fire. Yeah. It looks like fire, but it's not the fire. The reason why we have God today is because God is going only after it has gone through fire. Why fire? Because fire purifies. So when we worship God, we draw closer to what He is, the fire. And it's when we worship Him that worship begins to burn away the pride. Worship begins to burn away the lies. Worship begins to burn away the deceit. Worship begins to burn away the jealousy. Until what remains is the image of Christ. Amen. So the purpose of worship is not for God's needs, but it's for the worshippers' needs. That's why he said he's looking for true worshippers. And the true worshippers are those who worship in the spirit and the truth. That's the condition for worship. We just on that. Now let's look at what the Bible gives us as worship. Last night I mentioned that in the identity of a thing, the purpose of the thing is revealed. Remember where I dealt with the car, the truck, and the van? Watch this. Anywhere, everywhere in the Bible, the manual, the word worship is mentioned. 
The human action is never singing. In the Bible, when you find the word worship, the human action is not singing. But in church, when they say it's time for worship, <laughs> we sing. Mm. But we don't do what the Bible says. I'll prove it to you. The Bible teaches us we need two or three witnesses to establish a thought or a doctrine, right? Meaning, don't allow anyone to stand here and tell you both people both statement without showing the proof. If somebody stands here and tells you statements without proof, put those statements aside until they can prove it with scripture. Because we're not speaking our ideas, we must always be speaking the word of God. So I just told you, in the Bible, when you find the word worship, W-O-R-S-H-I-P, the human action is not singing. Then let's find out what it is. We're going to do some Bible study now. Because I want us to look at how the Bible identifies worship so we can draw its purpose. Genesis 22, verse 26. Are you still with me? Yes. Genesis 22, verse 26. Context. Abraham has sent his servant to go and look for a wife for his son Isaac. The man said to God, The first woman I meet and I ask her for a drink, and she gives me something to drink, and she gives my parents. That's the one. When he got to the river, he met Rebecca, and she teaches there. Verse 26. The Bible. Now you want to have to look at your Bible because we need to do this together. What are we looking for? We're looking for the human action when the word worship appears in the Bible. Actually, that's the second mention. Let's start at the first mention, the one that we saw on Friday night for the benefit of those who are not here. Start at Genesis 22 verse 5. This is where the word worship is mentioned the first time. The Bible says, And he said to his servant, Who is the he? Abraham. He said, stay here with the donkeys. The boy and I will go over there. He said, we will worship. You see the word worship? Mm. And we will come back. What Abraham was talking about here is not singing songs. But he was talking about killing. Mm. Mm. Killing his son. Remember, why are we doing this exercise now, saints? Listen to me, listen to me, you're good. We are looking for the human action when worship is mentioned. So we can see, is it about singing songs or is it about something else? We know the story. Abraham was going to kill his son in obedience to, the, to God. So the very first mention of worship is not music. As a matter of fact, look at the next verse, number six. The Bible says, Abraham took the wood for the bed of a ring and placed it on Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went together. Pastors, this is what the Lord showed me. These are not the instruments of worship. Amen. If you go to a music store and say you want to buy worship instruments, they won't understand what you're talking about. These are not instruments of worship. These are music mm. instruments. These are instruments to make music, not to make worship. What is an instrument? An instrument is a tool that you use for a particular function. For the function of music, we use those things. But for the function of worship, verse number six says Abraham had the wood, had the knife, had the fire. These are instruments of worship. The wood, the knife, and the fire. Why? Because in the place of worship is not a place of singing, it's a place of killing. Yes. <laughs> How are you going to kill with the drugs? That's why when we have all these worship nights, nothing dies. It's too much. It's too much. Nothing dies. Now, Churchill, what is the wood and the knife and the fire? I'm not teaching about this today, but let me just drop the thought. The knife is the sharp tool for cutting, right? Remember, the Old Testament uses symbols. But in the New Testament, we don't use symbols. All symbols are explained in the New Testament. 
The knife is for cutting. What is the only tool we have in the Testament for cutting? Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, he says, put on the armor of God. He talks about the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, the belt, and the and in the sentence. And then he said, put on the sword of the spirit. The knife represents the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Meaning, you can't worship if you don't read the word. Mm. And I wonder why our worship 